Well, now we're going to have to settle down and do some studying as we turn to our sixth chapter, Reckoning, in Romans 6. So if you turn to Romans 6, 1, we'll see what the Lord has for us there. Romans 6, 1. Now, Romans 5 has mainly to do with our justification and uh, peace with God. And Romans 6 has mainly to do with our freedom from the power of sin and our growth in our Christian life, the foundation for our growth, the basis for our growth, the fact that we're alive unto God in Christ and that in our position we've been freed from the old life, cut off by the cross in our death with Christ at Calvary. So these are, the, these are the things that we're going to carefully study. It may take us two sessions to get through, but we'll, we'll move along and uh, be very careful as to how we look at these verses. If you look up in uh, Romans 5.20, Paul says, But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And we all know how sin abounded when we were unsaved and lost, dead in trespasses and sins. We were in the grip of sin, and we were already dead to God, already condemned. And sin certainly abounded. But then we came to see what the Lord Jesus had done at Calvary in our, on our behalf, and we came to see that uh, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And we escaped the penalty of sin. We received life eternal in the Lord Jesus by grace. So Paul is presenting a thought here in Romans 6, 1 that some may be thinking. They may feel that, well, if um, grace abounds uh, where sin is abundant, why not uh, continue in sin so that we receive more grace? What should we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And, uh, of course, uh, Paul says, perish the thought, God forbid. And in verse 2, he, he uh, gives a reason. How are you as a Christian going to go on living in sin if, uh, if you have uh, died to sin? And this, of course, is the key concerning sin, our death with the Lord Jesus Christ. And our King James Version it makes it very difficult. <clears throat> it is not really what we need for our study Bible. It's uh, wonderful for our general use. But when it comes to studying, especially when it comes to studying concerning growth, we really need a study Bible such as the American Standard Version of 19.1 that gives the, the true tense of these truths so that one should have both of these uh, handy while he's studying in his general study. Now verse 2, Romans 6.2, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And the authorized version says, Such ones as we who died to sin, how shall we any longer be living in it? Who died to sin? Well, that's what happened to each one of us in the Lord Jesus when we were identified with him at Calvary, that we died to sin. As an individual, each one of us died to sin, out of the realm of sin. And we were born again in the Lord Jesus and raised again in Him. And in these uh, verses here in Romans 6, it's the same, the same facts are brought out about this past tense that we have already passed through death and that we're now alive in the Lord Jesus. Verse 2, it died to sin. Verse 3, baptized into His death, past tense. And verse 4, buried with Him. Verse 5, planted or united with him in the likeness of his death. And then verse 6, our old man was crucified with him. 
And verse 7, he that hath died with Christ. Verse 8, we died with Christ. And of course, uh, verse 11, reckon yourselves dead unto sin or as having died unto sin. So that's, we must realize that we're talking about something that already happened to us in Christ. It doesn't, uh, verse 2 doesn't call for us to die to sin. It is telling us that we have died unto sin. And many Christians feel, well, if I'm going to be a better Christian, I have to crucify myself, I have to die to sin. And uh, there's where self-effort comes in, with self trying to uh, cast out self, and of course that's impossible. And the key for us to see is the fact of uh, God's finished work, what He has done on our behalf, what He has done with us in Christ. And when we see what He has done, then our faith has something to rest upon, we have something to reckon upon, we have the facts to reckon upon. And by our reckoning on the finished work, we begin to experience that finished work in our daily life here and now. So Romans 6 is actually saying, such ones as we who died to sin, how shall we any longer be living in it? Now it doesn't mean that the Christian is never going to sin, but it means to be living in sin, to be choosing that way of life, to go on continually, go on uh, sinning as he did before he was saved. That the Christian, uh, there's going to be sin in his life, but when he finds out what God has done about the sin, he's going to find out the key of escaping more and more progressively from the power of sin in his life. And he's going to be living in Christ. He's going to be living in his new Christian life. That's going to be the bent of his life. That's going to be the goal of his life. That's going to be the heart hunger, his heart hunger, uh, to live in Christ. And uh, that Christ might be seen in uh, every realm of his life that he won't be choosing to live in sin. The entire burden of his heart will be uh, to live in Christ. Not I, but Christ. So, in these verses, Paul is talking about how God sees us. That's what he lays out first, how God sees us, what God has done with us in Christ. And then as we come to see these facts, we begin to count upon them. And then our Father makes real in our walk what is real already of us, concerning us, in Christ. When we see that we're alive unto God in Christ, um and that he's cut us off from the power of sin at Calvary, we, our faith begins to uh, become stronger. We have confidence. And we realize we don't have to struggle with sin. But all we have to do is believe what God has done about sin, the work of Calvary, where God took us down into death and cut us off from the power of sin so that our Christian life becomes uh, a walk of faith instead of a struggle. Now let's look here at Romans 6, 3, where Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Well, here, of course, he's talking about our spiritual baptiz baptism, where the Holy Spirit placed us in Christ, immersed us in Christ, caused us to be born anew in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, uh, when it comes to water baptism, we're, we're setting forth a picture of that fact. Our death and burial with the Lord Jesus, and our resurrection in him as we come up out of the water. Now, who, who came up out of the water? Who, who came up out of death in Christ? Well, we did, but we came up as new creations in Christ Jesus. We didn't, uh, self didn't come up. 
itself uh, didn't come up as far as God is concerned up out of the uh, tomb. Self uh, was crucified. The old nature was crucified. And we, as new creations in Christ, were resurrected in Him. God was free to raise us because the penalty of our sin was paid in that very death of the Lord Jesus when He died for our sins. <clears throat> so what we're seeing here is our relationship to sin that dwells within us in the self-life, the old life, the Adamic life. Our relationship to that sin and our relationship to self is that we have been cut off from it in death. And our relationship to the Lord Jesus is that we've been born anew in Him. Now this is speaking of our relationship, it is not speaking of our experience. But we must first see clearly our relationship, our position, and our experience will flow from those facts as we reckon, as we count upon them. Now I want to ask you some questions that will help uh, see the difference between our relationship and our walk in this matter of death. Do you believe that you have died to sin? Well, do you feel dead? Well, the Christian says, no, I, I feel very much alive and Matter of fact, I feel that uh, sin is very much alive in my heart. It bothers me time and time again throughout the day. Well, another question is, uh, does it seem like presumption for you to say that, you're, that you've died to sin? And the Christian, uh, the average Christian naturally says, well, since I'm so aware of sin within my life, it does seem like presumption to say, for me to say that I have died to sin. So the reason it seems like presumption is that we're more conscious of sins working in our heart than we are of uh, what God has done about our relationship to sin at Calvary. Which are we most conscious of? Well, uh, we're going to be more conscious of our feelings than we are of what the Word says until we become more uh, clear about the record of the Word. Our consciousness of what God says about us must become more clear and firm than uh, that which we feel within. There must be a transference from uh, feelings to faith, even for the Christian, in this matter. We have to begin thinking of uh, God's thoughts after him. We have to begin thinking of uh, what God says about us, rather than thinking of what we feel about ourselves. And God is telling us in these verses what is actually true of us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're aware to some extent of what is actually true of ourselves within our hearts, about the fact that self is active. We're aware of these two facts, but most Christians are more aware of self than they are of the but most Christians are more aware of self than they are of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're more aware of their relationship to self than they are of their relationship to the Lord Jesus. And the only way this can be changed and rectified is that we become uh, sure of our facts in the word. And God says that we have died to sin. And therefore, we cannot afford to go by our feelings. We have to go by the facts. And of course, facts are what the Christian life is built upon. Facts of the Word. 
And that's why it's so important for us to uh, get clear about these truths. Because we're never going to overcome our feelings. We're never going to get beyond what we feel until we become sure of what we believe. Now we all experienced something of this uh, when we got saved. We had to get beyond uh, our feeling lost uh, before we could believe that the Lord Jesus had saved us. And that's why the Christian has to be prepared. That's why he has to become so needy and hungry so that he'll believe God's word uh, right in the face of how he feels. He's seeking to teach us to not to live our Christian life by feelings, but to live it by facts. Now let's look here at uh, verse 4. Therefore we are, and the uh, authorized, the revised version, therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Well, now, burial, when a person dies and is buried, he's cut off from his present life. He's taken out of his environment. It's uh, complete and it's final. And our Father identified us with the Lord Jesus at the cross so that what the, when the Lord Jesus died to sin, he would take us down into that death and bury us in his burial. And we'd be cut off from the old life. Our relationship would be cut off. And we would be uh, given a new relationship of alive unto God in Christ, born anew in Him. Of alive unto God in Christ, born anew in Him. And the Word says here that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Well, it doesn't mean that uh, we walk uh, in a perfectly brand new life without sin. That's not going to happen. But it's a new walk. It's a walk uh, no longer dependent upon the old life. It's a walk that is centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a walk in the Spirit, in the Spirit of Christ. A walk in dependence upon Him. That is a new attitude that I realize I can't live the Christian life in my own strength and wasn't meant to. That the Lord Jesus is waiting to live His, His life through us. He's our Christian life. And that as I learn to depend upon Him and exercise my faith in Him, uh, He'll be free to produce. He'll be free to manifest Himself in and through us. That's the Christian life. And that's walking in newness of life. It's walking in a new environment. It's walking with a new attitude. It's walking with a new dependence of hating the old life and loving the new life of realizing that God cut us off from the old life and realizing that God has recreated us in the new life. We realize our relationship and that has its effect upon our daily walk. That we're joined to the Lord forever and that He now is our Christian life. Well, look at verse 5. <clears throat> for if we have been there's past tense finished work if we have been planted or united together in the likeness of his death <clears throat> we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection well he's told us that we were planted in the likeness of the Lord Jesus death that we were baptized into his death we were buried with him <clears throat> And we also know that the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Death couldn't hold him. And we know that we were uh, recreated in him and that when he rose, we rose. And that we are now alive unto God in the Lord Jesus.
And that's what our, our water baptism pictures, that we're brought up out of the water to uh, live for the Lord Jesus Christ and to live in Him, and to live from Him and in independence upon Him. And uh, that's walking in newness of life. Our baptism testifies to that. We, uh, we find out what happened to the Lord Jesus. We see that we were identified with Him. And we, uh, as we exercise faith in those facts, we begin to experience uh, those facts. We begin to find out that uh, the Christian life is not I, but Christ in our everyday walk. And the thing that's so important for us to see is the fact that it is a walk that God deals with us slowly and uh, persistently and a step at a time. That uh, even though we reckon upon the entire truth that we are new creations in Christ Jesus, uh, God makes us new creations in our experience uh, a little at a time. I like to think of that wonderful verse, those wonderful verses in Exodus 23 where God says, <clears throat> I will not drive them out from before thee in one year. He's speaking of Israel. Lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against thee. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee until thou hast thou be increased and inherit the land. <clears throat> and this is a wonderful truth that God doesn't clear the way for us completely as soon as we begin to reckon. That he leaves obstacles in the way on purpose so that we can learn to depend upon him and see him work. So that we can also find out that uh, just because we're reckoning upon the work of the cross, that doesn't uh, mean that we're to go ahead and uh, free ourselves. That as we reckon we rest, as we reckon we wait, and as we reckon He works, and He does all of the uh, freeing of us from the power of sin and self. And another thing, it's a personal thing between ourselves and our Father. That we may learn something of these truths through others and through uh, books that others have written. But when it comes right down to our everyday life and our everyday walk, uh, it's our uh, personal dependence upon Him and it's our personal faith upon the finished work of the cross. And it's our personal counting upon our position in the Lord Jesus Christ as risen in Him that will give us the results, that will give us the daily uh, growth and experience. Well, now let's look uh, at Romans 6.6. 6. This is the key verse of the entire truth that he has given us. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Our old nature, the nature that we received from Adam, self, was crucified with the Lord Jesus on the cross. So that uh, that element of sin within us, that life, that uh, source, Adamic source, that fallen source, uh, might be not destroyed, but uh, actually the word is annulled, put out of action. So that we will not, uh, so that we as uh, Christians, as new creations in the Lord Jesus, might not have to serve sin, that we might not be under the power of sin. That's why he crucified the old man, so that he can be held in the place of death by the Spirit and held uh, inoperative, so that he annuls his power through the finished work of the cross. so that we uh, we are new creations in Christ. We're a new man. We've been born anew. And the old man has been crucified and the new man has been uh, resurrected. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. 
old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And the old life uh, has been crucified. It's present within us, but it has been uh, crucified, and its power has been broken, so that we can uh, we can see it as crucified and uh, treat it accordingly. We don't have to serve sin. The Christian who doesn't know that self has been dealt with, he's under the domination of self. He doesn't know he has freedom, and he struggles to get freedom, and of course uh, his struggles aren't successful enough. Self is too strong, power of sin is too strong, and he fails, he flounders. But the Christian who realizes he's not stronger than sin realizes that God has already done the work, and he counts upon the facts. He doesn't struggle with the, with the problem. So that our old man has been crucified, and yet the old element is uh, still within our bodies. In uh, Colossians 3.9, Paul says to put off the old man with his deeds, and uh, you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The new man is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our new nature. And we are to see that uh, the domination of the old life has been broken. We put off the old man with his deeds at, the, at, at Calvary when it happened at the cross. And we, uh, we have the right to depend upon that finished work and to reckon ourselves as, uh, reckon self as having been crucified. And we reckon ourselves as new creations in Christ Jesus that we passed through death and we were recreated uh, in Christ. That now, as far as sin is concerned, we're dead. And as far as uh, our new life is concerned, we're alive unto God in Christ. That's our place, that's our position. And we're alive unto God in Him. And God wants us to count that a fact. Um, I might mention here that if you have a Schofield Bible, and you really should have one as far as your study goes, because uh, it's full of wonderful notes. And the Schofield notes are very fine, and uh, my, they're practically a, a Bible school education in themselves. And many Christians have these wonderful Bibles, and uh, they don't pay much attention to the notes. But there is a wonderful note that has to do with Romans 6, 6 at the bottom of the page, and it really should be studied very carefully. And by all means, as you come to these notes in the Schofield Bible, we are to give them uh, real attention. There are many uh, Christians who begin to... Uh, see these truths of their identification and they begin to count upon them. But then uh, they feel that they, as they reckon themselves dead, that they're there to go out and uh, put it into practice and to act dead and uh, crucify themselves. And uh, when they count themselves to be alive unto God in the Lord Jesus, that they're to go out and uh, walk as new creations in Christ and to um, bring into being that which they're believing. But that has the whole thing turned around backwards. That's what we might call behaviorism. And that uh, is a strong factor in our churches today, behaviorism. That uh, you go out and behave yourself in a certain way and you'll be that way. Don't do this and don't do that and uh, act this way and act that way and that'll be your Christian life. But no, activity and uh, acting won't do it. Believing is what uh, brings the true experience about. As we believe what God has done with us, He'll make that true in our walk. <clears throat> he won't do it quickly, but He'll do it as we move along in our Christian life. It's not behaviorism, but it's believing. Now I want to think a little bit about this word destroyed in verse 6, what it really means, that the old 
sinful life was annulled, its power was broken. Because that uh, <coughs> that Greek word is uh, katargio, and uh, it means put down, put out of work, or put out of business, or to render ineffective. And that's what the cross did to the old life. It annulled its power. And we get the benefit of that annulment as we count upon that finished work. That henceforth we should not have to serve sin. Paul uses that same word in uh, Romans 3.3, 3, to make without effect, and in Romans 3.31, to make void. Romans 4.14, 4, to make of none effect. And in Romans 7.2, uh, loosed. And Romans 7, 6, delivered. All the same idea. And Paul uses that word uh, 26 times in his letters. Annulled. <coughs> but it doesn't mean annihilated. It doesn't mean destroyed. It actually means uh, inactive, not working, unprofitable, idle. So that as we count upon the work of the cross and uh, the old nature having been crucified, these meanings will be true of it. It will be annulled and we'll be free to uh, walk in the Lord Jesus and uh, grow in him, abide in him. And it'll be more and more not I but Christ. And we don't have to, the Christian doesn't have to yield to the power of sin in his life. And he won't yield to it when he realizes that God has already dealt with it. You remember the truth that uh, Paul brings out in Romans 6.16. It's the principle that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether it is uh, sin that brings forth death or obedience unto righteousness. And if the Christian yields to the self-life, uh, he's going to bring forth sin. But when he yields to the Lord Jesus, uh, he's going to bring forth righteousness. He's going to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. But the Christian, only the Christian who knows that old, the old life was crucified is the Christian who will refuse to yield to the power of sin in his life. And he'll be free to yield to the new power, the power of the Spirit, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He can, he's the one who can say, not I, but Christ. He can say it by faith. And he'll get the results of it in his daily walk. <clears throat> now let's look at uh, Romans 6, 7. For, thee that, for he that hath died hath been declared righteous from sin. Or for he that is dead is freed from sin, as we have in our King James. For he that hath died hath been declared righteous from sin or has been justified from sin, he has been freed from the power of sin. Has been. Well, that's our position. And that's what God wants us to see. Now, when the Christian does not see that he, that the old life has been crucified with Christ, he only has one alternative. When he's aware of sin and self in his life, the only alternative he has is to uh, seek to rectify the problem and seek to make self better, seek to be a better Christian and strive to be a better Christian, plead with God to make him a better Christian. Whereas uh, God is seeking to show the Christian here in these truths that he's already made him a better Christian. He's already recreated him in the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus is his Christian life. What, what, what more does he want than that? 
What better Christian life could he have than that? And that's our position. That's our inheritance. And uh, God wants him to believe that. And as he believes it, the Holy Spirit is free to not make the old self-life better, but simply manifest the new life that's already within, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And instead of seeking to make the old life better, the Holy Spirit holds it in the place of death. He annuls its power. He holds it in the place of crucifixion. As we count ourselves to have been crucified, count the old life to have been crucified. And it's a matter of uh, applying the cross to the old life and simply abiding in the new life. So that the Christian who knows these truths is the one who doesn't have to struggle. All he has to do is believe. Romans 6, 8, Now if we be dead with Christ, actually if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And when the Christian realizes that uh, he's passed through death and he's a new, creature, new creation in the Lord Jesus, well, uh, he realizes that's the source of his life and it's, it's in Christ that he lives doesn't have to live in the old life. He doesn't have to live in sin. doesn't have to depend, on, to depend upon self to try to live the Christian life. The natural result of death is resurrection. And if he sees that he passed through death in Christ, he knows that he's resurrected in him. We should also live with him. Well, the Lord Jesus is uh, risen. He's our risen And that brings us to Romans 6, 9. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from among the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Well, he's free from the Lord Jesus. Uh, he always was free from the power of sin, except when he took our sin upon him at Calvary on the cross. And then, of course, the power of sin worked on him and took him down to death. He died for our sins. But when he paid the penalty of sin by dying for it, the perfect uh, sacrifice, the Lamb of God, he was free to rise again. And now, since uh, the penalty of sin has been paid, the Lord just died for our sins, and he died unto sin. He's risen now, and sin has no more claims upon him. So we find out what happened to him, and then we realize that we were identified with him and that we're new creations in Christ Jesus, born anew in him, r risen in him. Well, sin and death have no more claims upon us. Sin is within us. Death is within our bodies. But uh, they have no more claims upon us as new creations in Christ Jesus. Let the body die. We're going to get our new body. But the new life within, the life of the Lord Jesus, will never die. And that's the life we depend upon. That's the life we reckon upon to live the Christian life. Romans 6.10 keeps following right on with this truth. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And that word is unto. It isn't talking about when he died for our sins. It's talking about when he died unto sin, when he died unto, out of the realm of the principle of sin, the power of sin. That's where he took us. He took us in his death, and we died unto sin, too, <clears throat> in him. <clears throat> and this is, this is the truth of identification. These are the facts of our identification. <clears throat> Uh, we, we must realize that our history uh, began all over again at the cross when we rose in the Lord Jesus. Our, we, we started a new history in Christ Jesus. And our history as uh, <coughs> excuse me, lost individuals in Adam has been, uh, has been completed. We died to all that. And that was left in the tomb. The Adamic life, as far as God is concerned and as far as we should be concerned, it was left in the tomb. And now we're alive unto God in Christ Jesus. And that's what God wants us to see, that we're new created. And when we there will be any effort to come on it. If it is not too sure, and our, and our faith becomes a struggle, and we're not quite sure. And faith uh, cannot flourish. Uh, true faith has to have uh, explicit facts to rest upon, explicit truth. 
understood truth, plain, clear truth to rest upon. Otherwise, it's not uh, pure faith. And that's why we're going over these truths and over these truths and we're uh, repeating them and uh, iterating and reiterating them so that they'll finally become clear. Because if we seek to reckon before we're clear about the truths, our reckoning will flounder. We will give up. We'll turn back. And we'll, we'll blame the truth. We'll say, well, the truth doesn't work for us. Whereas we don't really see the truth to count upon it. And after uh, Paul very carefully presents these truths in these first ten verses, he, he says in verse 11, Likewise, reckon, count ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Jesus Christ our Lord, in Christ Jesus. <coughs> we say, Yes, Lord. I realize now that uh, at Calvary thou didst take me down into death in the Lord Jesus, and that thou didst recreate me as a new creation in him. And I count upon those facts. Dead to the old, alive in the new. That's what he's asking us to believe. And then he wants us to be so sure of these truths, so confident in his faithfulness, in this finished work, that will not be afraid to wait while he works them out in our daily life. Now you'll notice in verse 12 where he says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Well, we don't, he's not saying there to let not sin therefore reign by struggling against it. That's why he's given us all his truth of the finished work so that we wouldn't struggle. So there wouldn't be any self-effort, but simply to rest upon the fact of the effort of the Lord Jesus as he went up on Calvary and took us down to death with him. We don't have to let sin reign in our daily life, in our mortal body, because God has already dealt with it. In verse 13, he keeps on going. He says, Neither yield you, ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. We don't have to yield to sin. But he is calling for us to yield ourselves unto him. To yield ourselves unto God. Well, the Christian isn't going to feel free to yield himself. He's not going to be able to really yield himself unto God if he feels that he's still a slave to sin. If he can't break away from the self-life, if he can't get free from the domination of the self-life, how, how can he yield uh, to his father? That's why Christians have such a struggle trying to yield. They, they aren't free to yield. They're slaves to sin. And uh, they feel, well, if I could only yield to God, then I'd be free from sin. But it doesn't work that way. God uh, freed us from the power of sin through the cross, not through yielding to him. But he freed us from the power of sin so that we could be free to yield to him as new creations in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to get first things first here. We have to see what he did and count upon it. And that, slow but sure, will free us so that we're free to abide in the Lord Jesus, yielded to our Father. And the key to this 13th verse is the next sentence, as those that are alive from the dead. Well, how many Christians realize that they're alive from the dead? How can a Christian yield himself to God as one who's alive from the dead when he doesn't know that he's been risen in the Lord Jesus? And he, he can't be sure that he's risen in the Lord Jesus until he's sure that he's been cut off from the old life, that he's, he's been uh, taken down to death and freed from the Adamic life. And that uh, because he did die in Christ, that now he's alive in Christ. You see how God has these truths all tied together and all geared. You have to believe one thing before you can believe the other thing. We have to believe that we were taken down to death before we can believe we're resurrected. We have to see clearly that God dealt with the old life before we're free to uh, enjoy the benefits of the new life. And that's why most Christians today who don't see these truths and don't know anything about 
identification. They know all about the substitution where the Lord Jesus died for their sins and paid the penalty. They know about their justification, but those aren't growth truths, that's a birth truth. And the Christian who doesn't know these truths of identification, his life is a, an admixture all day long, part of self and part of Christ, mostly self, because he doesn't know that he's been freed from self, the self-life. And he tries to yield to God, and uh, self drags him down and uh, causes him to be stubborn and to retake his consecration, take it back and spoil it. And part of the time he's yielded, and part of the time he isn't yielded. And it's just, uh, it's some of self and some of Christ. It's, it's an awful way to have to live. But that's where most cr uh, struggling Christians are. And uh, the cry of their heart is, O wretched man that I am, who shall free me from the body of this death? He realizes that death is working within sin, self. And the only Christian who can really yield himself to God as one who is alive from the dead, is a Christian who knows that he was taken down at death and that the old life was crucified and that uh, he was recreated as a new creation in Christ. That's how important these truths are. Without, these, uh, without this basis for our Christian life, there's no progress beyond, uh, no real progress beyond justification. The Christian is saved, but he's not growing. He's saved and struggling. And, of course, there are many Christians who uh, claim to be saved and they're not even struggling. They're just existing. They're, they're waiting to get to heaven. And they don't realize that all the wonderful development and growth there is for them to uh, have the Lord Jesus manifesting himself in and through them, that others might be drawn to him. And in this verse 14, Paul says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law but under grace. So that the Christian does not have to yield to sin. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. If we obey sin, we become a servant to sin. If we yield to the Lord Jesus, look to him, we become his servants and he rules and reigns in our life instead of sin reigning in our life. And he manifests himself more and more instead of sin manifesting itself, instead of the self-life manifesting itself. So now in verse 17, Paul says, uh, but, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Well, here in these first uh, verses, these first ten verses, and, uh, are, is the form of doctrine, doctrine that he's delivering to us. That we died in Christ and that we're risen in Christ. And he's asking us to believe that. That up until the time that we do begin to count upon it and reckon upon it, we're the servants of sin. We're struggling under the power of a self-life. And we're yielding to sin. And that which we yield to, we become servants to. And he says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart. Well, now we can't, uh, we can't obey from our heart unless we're sure, unless we're sure of our facts. We might try to obey from the heart. We may mean it, but it isn't, it isn't really from the heart until we know our rights and our position in the Lord Jesus, that uh, we have been freed from the power of sin and that we're uh, established in Him. Then we can obey from the heart that truth that uh, He has just shown us here, that He's delivered to us. And He's saying here in verse 18 that uh, being made free from the power of sin, we become the servants of righteousness. That the more we count upon our having died unto sin, the more we count upon self, the old life having been crucified, uh, the more we're free to uh, look to Him and abide in Him and yield to Him. And the more we yield to righteous, uh, to, to Him, the more righteousness there is, the more manifestation there is of His life. 
because that uh, to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, uh, his servants ye are to whom you obey. So that we become uh, true servants of the Lord Jesus simply by believing that uh, he freed us and that we're alive in him. It's not by a lot of consecration and a lot of trying to yield and a lot of uh, trying to work for him. That isn't the way we become servants. We become servants by realizing that he is our life and that we're born anew in him, recreated in him, that we've been freed from the old life. We don't any longer have to serve sin. And we, we love him and look to him and depend upon him and that makes us his servants. And more and more is, we're obviously his servants. It's obvious to see. Well, these are these are wonderful truths. These are these are the liberating truths. And down here in verse twenty two, but now being made free from the power of sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And that that's what the hungry hearted uh, Christian is yearning for. That's what that's the burden that the Holy Spirit has placed in his life that the he might become more and more a holy Christian. That he might become more and more Christ-like. That's the burden that the Holy Spirit puts in the newborn Christian's heart. And he puts a, a greater and greater hatred of sin within the Christian's life. And a hatred of the old life that uh, brings forth these sins. He that hated his life, uh, he's asking us to hate the old life. And uh, he's asking us to love the Lord Jesus, our new life. We have fruit unto holiness as we are become the servants of God, as we depend upon him, as we look to the Holy Spirit and walk in the Spirit, in dependence upon the Spirit. What happens? Well, the fruit of the Spirit is uh, more and more manifest in our lives. The love of the Lord Jesus and the joy of the Lord Jesus and the peace of the Lord Jesus, all these different fruits, the fruit of the Spirit are aspects of the life of the Lord Jesus. And as we grow, these things become more and more apparent. Not that we produce them, not that we try to be that way, but that uh, the life within takes over more and more fully in our, in our mortal body. And God does this by his daily process. As we believe, he processes. As we reckon, he works. And all, all of God's work in our Christian life is drawn from a finished source, that which he's already done. All of the work that he does in crucifying self daily, holding it uh, inoperative, nullifying its power, he's drawing that work from uh, the work that he did at Calvary when he crucified the old life on the cross. And the Holy Spirit is ministering that finished work in our daily walk. We which live are all way delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. And that's God's process of taking us into difficult situations and circumstances whereby self is dealt with, self is put down, that we're made nothing in our old life and uh, that we hide in the Lord Jesus and abide in Him, and uh, out of that nothingness, He's manifested. Not I, but Christ. And He takes us through all these things that give the new life an opportunity to develop, reasons to develop. As we brought out in our uh, former chapters, that uh, when we're called upon to suffer, why that we find our the suffering deals with the old life and it produces a, a contrite, humble, tender characteristic of the new life. And we learn the comfort of the Lord in our sufferings so that the new life emerges out of this suffering as a chastened spirit, as the very spirit of the Lord Jesus. And uh, when we're called upon to 
sacrifice for others? Well, that, that's that's the very nature of the Lord Jesus. Self doesn't like to sacrifice. Self wants to gain everything for itself. So that uh, when we're called upon to sacrifice, put into circumstances where we must sacrifice, that crucifies self. That takes self down into death. But out of that death emerges the sacrificial, lamb-like life of the Lord Jesus. We which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. Why? That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. And that's why all of these things, are, that's why all things are working together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknow, foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. And that's, uh, that's God's purpose for us, that we might be like the Lord Jesus. And the only way we can be like him and the only way he can be manifest in our mortal body is that we be taken through all this process. He uses our home, he uses our work, he uses whatever ministry we might be in, he uses our relationships to husband and wife or children, people we work with, neighbors. All of these things, uh, God has geared them all together to the one purpose to daily crucify self and to daily manifest more and more the Lord Jesus. Well, now let's tie this together a little bit. Who was crucified on Calvary with the Lord Jesus? Well, the Word very explicitly tells us that in, in Romans 6, 6, that our old man was crucified with him. And we know that our old man is the old nature. It's the uh, nature we received from a fallen Adam, the nature we were born with originally. And uh, instead of our having to make that life better in Christian, we have to realize that God crucified it. He took it to the cross in the Lord Jesus. That's all it was worth. That's all that could be done with it. Crucifixion. So we, we must get that straight that as far as everything that, that is in us that is not the Lord Jesus, not from the new life, has been crucified on the cross. And we're to count the old life, that source, as having been crucified. And as we count upon it, then we get the benefit of that faith by the Holy Spirit working within our hearts and dealing with self. He deals with self, and he deals with self by means of the cross. He applies the work of the cross to our daily life. We which live are all way delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. And then when we think of uh, Romans 6.11, it says we're to count ourselves to have died unto sin. And we're to count ourselves alive unto God in Christ. Well, now, who is ourselves? Well, that is me as a Christian, as a born-again, recreated, new creation in the Lord Jesus. That's the new life. That's who I am as a Christian. He took me down in, took me through death in Christ, and He resurrected me in Him. For since we have died with Him, we believe that we shall also live with Him. And we are to count ourselves as new creations in Christ Jesus, passed through death and uh, born anew in Him. So there are three factors here in our reckoning, in our counting, that uh, right here. Counting upon the old life as having been crucified, and the Holy Spirit will crucify it daily. Counting upon my new life as having passed through death. Death cut us off from the power of sin, and uh, the resurrection out of that death has given us the life of the Lord Jesus. We've been born into him, now he's our life. For ye died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And God wants us to count upon that. 
That's our position. That's where I am. I'm in the risen Lord. Heaven is not just my home after I pass out of this world. Heaven's my home now. That's where he wants me to rest, in him. Far above all of our circumstances and conditions uh, that we're in down here in this world. Well, we must close now. There's plenty more studying to be done in this Romans 6. But the Holy Spirit will guide as the hungry heart digs. Our Father, we thank Thee for this portion of truth. We ask that Thou wilt train us carefully in it, show it to us clearly, and help us to realize that all of this takes time to see, not to be discouraged, not to give up. We thank Thee for the needs that press us on and uh, cause us to hunger for the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that we'll prepare our hearts now for this next chapter, chapter 7, that we might gain uh, further insights, that our faith might be strong and clear as we rest upon the truth. We thank Thee for Thy faithfulness in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.